think it's one of the most important and brilliant English rock pop acts of all time. They remain one of the most influential bands in popular music history. Blazing on a sunny afternoon. The Kinks were Ray and Dave Davis, and the fractious but clearly very important relationship that uh, lay between them. Ray Davis was born on the 21st of June 1944 in Fortis Green, North London. His younger brother, Dave Davis, followed on the 3rd of February 1947. They were eight kids, of which they were the youngest by far. They were six much older sisters. Clearly, the family dynamic would mean that the two brothers would become quite competitive. This did create a seam of competitiveness, which would run through their personal lives. Ray and Dave's early musical influences came, I think, partly from their parents and their musical records, and partly from his older sisters who were listening to jazz and early rock and roll. And also there was a sense of um, music always in their house. Apparently, you know, after a night down the pub, his parents would bring back people and there'd be a big sing-along round the family piano. Ray Davis wasn't a very well boy. He had a tracheotomy at the age of 15 and he was quite sickly and one of his sisters, Rene, gave him his first guitar and this proved to be, of course, his forte. And he formed the, the Ray Davis Quartet with Dave and Pete Quaif, who would later become a kink. And they tried out a bunch of singers, one of which was Rod Stewart. Now, obviously, he didn't join. He went off and formed his own rival band, and the rest is history. After a series of encounters and engagements with other groups at Hornsey College of Art and Central School of Art and Design, Ray Davis finally put together the band The Ravens. And this is uh, the first band that features Mick Avery and Pete Quaif. This is kind of the blueprint of the kinks. And then they got these two quite public school managers called Robert Wace and Grenville Collins. And Ray did a very strange thing, I'm assuming it was Ray, where he got a third manager. It was Larry Page, who'd been a former pop star himself. And so, you know, it's kind of setting yourself up for problems because you've got one set of managers, another manager. They're not going to get on. They didn't get on. Caused lots of problems further down the line. They signed to Pi Records in 1964. And this was really at the instigation of Shel Talmy, who was a mover and shaker, and he would produce the first few Kinks albums. There's a couple of different stories about how they came to the decision of the name The Kinks. Uh, one is that Larry Page decided it was a reflection of how they should look. In the 60s, the word kinky had slightly maverick implications. It was a little bit risque, it was a little bit rude, and so The Kinks very much reflected that. The first two Kink singles were flops. Long Tall Sally was a cover of the Little Richard song and You Still Want Me was a Ray original. Neither got airplay and neither sold much at all. Pi Records, who'd signed a, just signed a deal with them, said, if it happens a third time, we're ripping up the contract, you're out. Thank God it didn't happen a third time. You really got me going, you got me so I don't know what I'm doing. The third single after the first two flops was You Really Got Me. This is, wasn't just a massive hit, it, you know, it was number one song, but also it was such an important song in the history of rock and roll. The thing about the song that's so unique is the guitar distortion, which really hadn't been heard before. And this was created by Dave Davis slashing his little tiny amplifier, then putting it through a larger amp, and it creates what we now know as distortion, but then was a very exciting new guitar sound. There's one thing you gotta do to make me still want you. Tell us up seven now. The debut album Kinks was a big hit. It went to number four on the chart, and it had Stop Your Sobbing, which is a fantastic song. It had You Really Got Me. Apart from that, it was mainly cover versions. This was the announcement of the Kinks as a very good, strong and exciting rock and roll band. By May 1965, the Kinks were very successful in both Britain and the United States, but they were also having troubles too. There's a famous gig where Dave Davis was getting very angry and mocking the drummer, Mick Avery. Avery lost his temper and he got a cymbal and he fired it at uh, Dave Davis's head. It could have decapitated him. Luckily, he only needed 16 stitches. <laughs> In 1965, when the Kinks were on another tour of America, and they really were the second British band to go there and make it big, 
after the Beatles. Then they fell foul of the American Federation of Musicians. Following an altercation between Ray Davis and a producer on the Dick Clark Show, the Kinks were banned from touring America. This is huge. You know, they're part of the British invasion and they're told they can't come back and play for four years. The reasons for this are still very murky. There was clearly problems about the Kinks paying interstate taxes in the United States. There were difficulties because they refused to join a union. Especially the American Federation of Musicians did not like all these bands coming over. The Beatles were untouchable, but the Kinks, he believes, were the ones who had to take the hit for everyone. Recording on Kind of Kinks, their second album, was started the day after they returned from tour and it was recorded and released within two weeks, which is just incredible. It's just such a fast turnaround. But of course, because it was so fast, there was no time to really go back and check the mixes and make sure it sounded OK. And Ray Davis apparently was really unhappy with how the final track sounded. He says, you know, you listen back to it now and there's some really good songs on that album, but they just don't sound very well put together. And you can do what you want. Tired of Waiting For You was a number one hit in Britain and it went to top six in the United States. And it was, at the time, the most significant kink single because it was a huge departure from You Really Got Me and All Day and All of the Night. And it, it showed that there was slightly more to Ray Davis's lyrics and his songwriting than had previously been the case. See My Friends was another very, very influential kink song. Ray Davis, the rest of the band, were in a stopover in Bombay, and Ray heard the chants of fishermen early morning going to work. He picked something up in the intonation, which he then used in the music. This notion of there being a sitar on a Western pop record was absolutely unheard of at the time. Pete Townsend heard it, and he brought an Eastern influence to The Who on the basis of this, and likewise The Beatles. Cos he gets up in the morning and he goes to work at night with the singles, a well-respected man and dedicated follower of fashion, I think you can see the moment that there's a style shift, not only in the sound of the Kinks, but also in Ray Davis's songwriting. And he's all so good, and he's all so fine. Some kind of minor aristocrat had invited Ray Davis to play a, a round of golf where Ray Davis was on holiday in Torquay, of all places. And then he wrote about the well-respected man who had risen by conforming, by being like everyone else. And these characters were the start of Ray Davis writing little acute characters. They were having all these hits, but they weren't making money. And the reason was is because they had this strange managerial system with the two managers on one side and then Larry Page on the other. They were suing each other. So all the money was held up. He was expected to keep pumping out this material. And he had a very young family, and it was getting to him. The outsider elements that is really at the heart of everything Ray Davis does was is kind of coming to the fore because he's meant to be successful, he's meant to be a rock star, everything was meant to be happening for him, but at the same time he had all these problems. The 1965's Kink Controversy was easily the best Kinks album at the time. It had a ring them bells on it, but it also had Where Have All the Good Times Gone, which was uh, the first moment where you could sense that Ray Davis had this feeling of nostalgia for, as he put it, the good times. Nicky Hopkins, one of the great session musicians of the British scene, went on to play with the Rolling Stones. He played keyboards on the kink controversy and also harpsichord, which gave it this rather baroque feel. Just before the release of the kink controversy, Ray Davis actually suffered a nervous breakdown. He was exhausted from touring, the pressures of fame. While recovering at home, Ray took his new style of songwriting to another level, with the chart-topping Sunny Afternoon. The tax man's taken all my dough. 
The Kinks' fourth studio album, Face to Face, was released in October 1966. Ray Davis' songs became very English around this period. And part of the reason is because he wasn't experiencing American culture because his band were barred from that. It did really well in the UK. It charted in the top 10. However, in America, it didn't even make the top 100. Waterloo Sunset is perfect pop. It went to number two in Britain, although it wasn't even released as a single in the United States. I consider that to be one of the greatest songs ever written. It captures romance and loneliness because you have Terry and Julie, this, this, uh, these lovers meeting on the bridge, but then you have the guy watching them. So it's terribly sad, but very, very, very affecting. It's absolutely beautiful. It's like a hymn to the Thames, to Waterloo, to London. It has gone down in music history as being one of the most beautiful pop records of all time. Dave Davis' solo single, Death of a Clown, went to number three. But it wasn't really a solo single. It was a track taken from the Kinks album, Something Else. It was a co-write, unusually, between Ray and Dave. And it was just credited to Dave, I think in a bid to get his solo career going. They'd been on tour so much that he said, we felt like performing seals. It became meaningless. You know, getting up there and entertaining the people, big smiles and getting on with it. So he, he wrote a song about it, so the death of a clown, the clown is him or the kinks. The kinks stopped touring at the start of 1968 in order to concentrate on working in the studio. Days was subsequently released as a single, followed by the album Village Green Preservation Society. The Village Green Preservation Society was uh, originally meant to be a, a pantomime. It evolved into this suite of songs, which was really a, a kind of rueful look at the, the British bucolic village culture that Ray Davis felt was slipping away. Ray Davis was definitely responsible for the Kinks drift away from commercial success to cult status, and I think it's because he got sick of having to come up with the hits. I think it drove him absolutely crazy, and he wanted to do something a bit more personal. It got to Pete Quaife, he left the band. The rest of the band continued. John Dalton joined and replaced Pete Quaife. Ray Davis insisted then that the Kinks turn to concept albums, and there are at least seven concept albums in a row. In 1969, Ray Davis decided to try and do something about this American band. He travelled to LA, he met with the American Musicians Federation and brokered a deal so that they could go back. The Kinks started becoming a cult band. They started becoming a big thing with college kids. And this was at the time of Arthur, or the decline of the British Empire. And this run of albums that Ray Davis would then do, which were these kind of theatrical, very themed pieces. She walked up to me and she asked me to dance. I asked her her name and in a brown voice she said hello. Hello, hello, hello. Lola is such a brilliant song by the Kinks, but there was some controversy over the lyrics of the song, because originally it was mentioning Coca-Cola, but the BBC were unhappy with the idea of kind of product placement within the song, so it had to be re-recorded as Cherry Cola, although the Kinks continued to sing Coca-Cola when performing it live. Lola was a, a freak, partially because it, was, it went top 10 in Britain and in America at a time when the Kinks were selling absolutely no records. It was about an encounter with a transvestite apparently based on some kind of real incident in the Kinks' past. But this was 
unknown territory for a, a pop lyric. And a lot of the American stations who played it would fade it out before we realised that Lola was, in fact, a man. Lola was also John Gosling's debut with the band, replacing Nicky Hopkins on keyboards. The album Lola vs. Power Man and The Money Go Round Part 1 was a satirical album, another concept album. It took the mickey out of the music industry quite a lot. It wasn't a great UK charting album. However, it did get them their first US Top 40 for uh, a number of years. Ray Davis uh, made a kind of conscious shift from recording and releasing pop and rock albums into more theatrical rock opera style recordings. Um, and these can be seen initially with Preservation Act 1 and Preservation Act 2, which are these kind of stories of this protagonist, Mr. Flash. Around the time of Preservation Act 1 in 1973 and Preservation Act 2 in 1974, Ray Davis had had another nervous breakdown. His wife had left him and taken the children, and he'd been diagnosed as bipolar. So he was going through a very difficult time. In the early 70s, the Kinks became this kind of really um, musical, theatrical act with this kind of extended troupe of people on the road. There were actors, there were horn players. It was very grand, very over the top. And there were a couple more um, kind of rock opera concept albums as well that were released before the band finally signed with Arista Records and they were advised to maybe strip back everything and return to that original kind of rock lineup. The Kinks RCA debut, Sleepwalker, came out in 1977. In the late 1970s, there were some lineup changes for the Kinks, but they still had some moderate success with the album Sleepwalker, Misfits, and Low Budget. And also around this time, they first started to get some recognition from their peers in terms of other bands covering them, most notably uh, The Jam, The Pretenders, Van Halen as well. Suddenly a new generation of musicians are tipping their hat to the kinks. Sleepwalker went to number 21 in America. Low Budget went to 11. And they, they had hit singles off them too. So this was a, a, a very, very unexpected and quite a dramatic revival. The Kinks' 19th studio album, State of Confusion, was released in 1983. The big highlight of the 80s for The Kinks was Come Dancing. Massive hit. It was, came out in 1983, and it's a tribute to Ray's older sisters. The album that came out on State of Confusion did very well as well. Do It Again was the, the last big American hit for the Kinks of 1984's Word of Mouth. But Ray was going through a hard time. He'd got together with Chrissy Hind, who had been a huge Kinks fan, and it was tempestuous. They apparently were on their way to the registry office, and they argued so much on their way that when they got there, the registrar said, are you sure you really want to go through this? And, and they didn't. were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, but commercially their popularity was still declining, um, and by 1996 um, they played their final show. Now this gig was actually for Dave's 50th birthday at the Clissold Arms pub in Muswell Hill, which is almost directly opposite their childhood home. The Kinks' legacy is to be one of the most influential bands of all time. They would not be millions of garage bands across America if it hadn't been for You Really Got Me in All Day of the Night. On the one hand, they influenced punk rock bands like The Jam with their kind of biting social commentary. They also influenced metal bands like Van Halen through their use of distortion and changing the way guitars could sound forever. And then they influenced, you know, a whole range of Britpop bands like Blur and Pulp with that idea of becoming very proud to be British and reflecting the quirks of British life. 
For a band that was never as successful as The Who, The Stones or The Beatles, The Kinks Legacy, I would say, is as influential as any of those huge bands. And it's all